Lisa, really appreciate your time today. And this is, you know, an issue that we have been following so closely just because we find it incredibly fascinating, but also the, the business possibilities, um, you know, in the future are, are just almost unlimited. W what do you think about Boeing's issues here? They, they've had to scrub this launch. That's not so unusual, right? Because they're so, the weather conditions, for example, are so important. Yeah, not at all. And it's really the, the logistics around a launch are complex and it, you have to get it right. So when they say go, it'll happen. Uh, in the meantime, we're looking at, you know, our orbital flight test two will be a launch and docking capability that they can prove out so that they can advance efforts with the NASA's commercial crew program, much like you saw SpaceX doing when they sent Bob and Doug to the International Space Station. And so when they do achieve this goal and they do have the ability to have uh, astronauts flying, uh, we're going to have more ability to have humans going to space and advancing the number of human beings that have flown to space because to date it's only been uh, less than 600. Uh, help me understand the, I mean, as Matt says, the potential is limitless. Uh, so far, of course, this has been dominated by uh, governments and billionaires. What's the commercial opportunity here that captures everybody, that captures kind of ordinary people, space tourism, whatever that looks like? Well, the, the opportunity is vast because we've got the astronauts going to space is only the opening of the door to the space opportunity. Uh, once we are in space, we can have in space manufacturing, which allows us to create materials in space that we cannot create on Earth. I imagine a metal alloy, for example, mm -hmm. that's twice the strength and half the weight. How valuable would that be to our aerospace industry or other industries? So there are materials that can be created, there are pharmaceuticals that can be created in a microgravity environment that cannot be created on Earth. So there's a lot of benefit to being in space uh, for research and development uh, that can benefit humanity, as well as just your basic, um, certainly, exploration and looking at uh, the prospects there of uh, operating in space and the kind of communication capabilities we can have that advance what we currently have today. You know, I think a lot of people don't think mm. about in-flight Wi-Fi or using Uber, that they're already interacting seamlessly with space. Mm. Uh, it's already a part of our lives. I can't wait until in-flight Wi-Fi genuinely works. Lisa, your company is called Explore. And, you know, one of the things that I'm most interested in is when are we going to get back to the moon? When are we going to really man uh, or, or woman, a Mars mission. You know, wh when is the space exploration going to really start to pick up? Well, we want to see Artemis happening. The targeted time frame for that was 2024, where we are going back to the moon. And my company, Explore, is offering uh, missions as a service with um, the ability to have orbital missions that bring data back that can help us enable uh, uh, our understanding of these harsh environments so that we can have more access to them and more ability to fly missions to the moon. So we're basically um, looking at this from a uh, smaller capability perspective where we have uh, or a high capability, but a small form factor spacecraft. So Explore has a smaller spacecraft that can perform orbital missions at a lower cost. And the more that we can achieve these missions, the more data we bring back that makes it a safer and better environment for human exploration. Safety, of course, is a big concern. And, you know, for every uh, imaginatory film or uh, exploration of the potential of space, there's an equally kind of horrific view of what could go wrong. We, we kind of brace ourselves every time humans go uh, get into a machine that's taking them to space. H how big a concern? How much can it be allayed? I mean, before we get to kind of widespread access to even near space, how much further do we need to go on the safety front? 
Well, well, let's not forget that Rosie the Rocketeer is the star of the OFT2 mission. They have an anthropomorphic uh, woman, if you will, that's going to have 15 sensors on her uh, gathering data during that flight to understand the human experience, the, the physical changes that occur, and to ensure that all of that data is gathered and we understand the full you know, uh, experience. So we also saw, by by the way, on the Virgin uh, Galactic flight that they were testing uh, what was happening in that environment. Uh, they had never had data, I believe, on the transition from uh, Earth to uh, 50 kilometers or 50 miles from Earth, uh, and they were gathering that information. So all of this just advances the knowledge that we have, and I would say NASA in its history has focused on safety and we're just really proud of the decades we've had of the International Space Station being a safe environment. Um, we did have a blip with uh, what happened with Russia docking last week. I think that was a complete anomaly, but to their credit, they they righted the ship and all is fine. Uh, but, you know, we haven't had incidences right. because of the layers of safety and protocols that are in place.